Amen. Now, as a foretaste of that heavenly joy, as Simon did so often in the chapel, to the great delight of many a director of music, we're going to encourage the congregation to join in the singing of the psalm. So please feel free to feel your way into the chant and to raise your voices in this Easter song of triumph. sent out with Elfrida Calvo Caressi to Uganda many, many years ago, written in my father's handwriting, sent to us by Elfrida back to us when um, our father died. And so I feel is a fitting full circle on a, on a poem that speaks to all of us about journeys and friends and the future. He wants not friends that have thy love, and may converse and walk with thee, and with thy saints here and above, with whom forever I must be. In the communion of the saints is wisdom, safety, and delight, <coughs> and whom my heart declines and faints, it's raised by their heat and light. As for my friends, they are not lost, the several vessels of thy fleet, though parted now by tempest lost, shall safely in the haven meet. 
Still we are centred all in thee, members though distant of one head. In the same family we be, by the same faith and spirit led. Before thy throne we daily meet, as joint petitioners to thee. In spirit we each other greet, and shall again each other see. The heavenly hosts, world without end, shall be my company above, and thou, my best and surest friend, who shall divide me from thy love? This excerpt from one of Simon's CMS newsletters, dated December 1983, entitled Grace and Truth, and written not long after meeting Father Sophroni, was selected by Paul Hunt, one of Simon's close colleagues and friends in CMS and later in the Coventry Diocese. This was the same Paul who introduced Simon and Jean to the Orthodox Monastery at Tolishant Knights and to Father Sophroni to whom he became so devoted. Most of our new Christologies in these days are too simple and sensible and rational to begin to comprehend the mystery. We have always tended either to separate Jesus from this world into a wholly ethereal, docetic ghost, or to naturalize him totally into a wholly ordinary, mildly radical human. At Chalcedon, they may have used alien and seemingly anachronistic categories, but at least their symbol was faithful to the essential movement of two opposite aspects held together, divine love, embodied and broken. In Jesus, contemplation in the spirit encounters and is drawn into a meeting place of God and man, divine and human, eternal fulfillment and earthly tragedy through pain and death and resurrection. Then by faith, we ourselves can be drawn through all our varied apprehensions of East and West, Asia and Africa, into the one great transfiguration of all things. This transfiguration is an extraordinary mingling of suffering and joy, as you can see in the faces of the saints. On my journeys around the world, or even around Britain for that matter, or even in my own office or in the CMS chapel at the communion, I never cease to be surprised by those startling moments of recognition of what I often call a family likeness. For me, it explains the unity in diversity of the New Testament or of the whole history and life of the church. In each differing culture and setting, Every detail has changed. The whole pattern of life is quite unlike another. And yet there, like a tune transposed into another key, is the same immediately familiar relatio, the interrelation of heaven and earth, divine and human, the authentic reflection of the glory of God in Christ in a human face, Christ in 10,000 places, to the Father through the features of men's faces.
A reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling himself to the world, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. May I speak in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you may say Amen if you wish. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honour and, uh, and I'm deeply grateful. It's the opportunity to speak at a time of thanksgiving for Simon Barrington Ward, who was for me and for many of you here a mentor, a friend and an inspiration in Christ. And he was devoted to his family, to Jean, Helen, Mary and grandchildren and the wider family, amongst all the other love that he gave. And I've been privileged to know this family for over 50 years and I'm not saying the exact date because you're not supposed to talk about uh, women's ages, even in these days. Those who want to know more about the breadth and length and height and depth of the love that Simon had for the Lord and for the world and for people uh, will glimpse much more in the book, Exchange of Gifts, edited by Graham Kings and Ian Randall, which are available at the door afterwards, and that's the end of the sales buff, but I have read it and it's a marvellous compendium of the creativity and the imagination and the extraordinary involvement Simon had with this world and its humanity. We will each add our own memories as this day goes on. For me, most gratefully, it's walking in the highland hills of my homeland in vivid conversation, where, as Sarah Caldwell has written, the starting point is not the church, but the person of Christ. And reminds me of the poet, though I have to admit it's a Welsh poet, if you know the quote, it reminds me of the air crumbling and breaking on us generously as bread. But the best memorial for Simon and for you and for me is to continue that flow of transformation, of encouragement, debate and risk in examining the claims or living afresh the good news of Jesus Christ. The writer of the few lines to the church in Corinth by St. Paul that uh, Helen's just read to us is written by someone who was at once a teacher, a missionary and a pastor, an indefatigable traveller. And here, even there in the first century, we can see the pattern for any who would be a Christian witness in the world. It's a pattern of the possibility of change. And in these few words, we see it's a personal Christ-given new creation. It's the power of being reconciled and reconciling. And then, as Helen read out so clearly in that last verse, it is the intention of God that these gifts should be part of an embassy, each one of us as ambassadors for Christ. But first of all, um, because uh, we're in a very Christian setting here, and that is unusual in this culture and this world. First of all, a big claim of the passage, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 to 21, is the confident assertion that all this is from God. Not easily arrived at, but distilled 
through philosophical, ethical and spiritual engagement in a world where experience of culture and power swirl around as much in the 20 and 21st centuries as they did in the first, often obscuring even a glimmer of faith, hope or even love. The Christian way, and this perhaps is what makes it so attractive when we're uncertain or confused, faces this reality head on, as we had to do two years ago, because Simon died on what Christians call Holy Saturday in the year two years ago. That day, as Alan Lewis writes, is between cross and resurrection, and often overlooked in a rush to celebrate the unique turning point in history. The Christian does well to hold together the three days, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter, not relegating the Saturday or neglecting it with the crucified Christ in the cold tomb, seemingly absent, about whom the Emmaus Road disciples said we had hoped. But giving time for loss and grief, not just personally, but publicly, as humanity faces a world of pandemic, war and migration. Yet, St. Paul writes, this is the same God of spiritual transformation who with profound love invites the skeptic or the despairing from a diminished ignoring or fitting of Christ to suit me attitude to an extraordinary new letting go, a moving on in steps of faith towards being made a new creation in Christ. At a time of a return to war in Europe now, Simon's early links with the church amongst the ruins of Berlin in 1948 reminded me of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's little book, Life Together, where people were created anew. All that mattered in those ruins, and for the ruins of the church, then and now, is finding the spiritual hope and true levelling up of forgiven sinners, all focused on the costly grace of God in Lord Jesus Christ, exploring and being formed by the small habits that last, daily prayer, reading scriptures, worshipping together, endless curiosity and acts of mercy when we have the strength to give them. This connected movingly um, in a private audience with the Queen, which is now obviously no longer going to be private, uh, when Simon was uh, handing over the jewel of office of the prelate of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. Um, there's more to this tale than I'm going to tell, but you can ask me afterwards. Uh, they got on to the Coventry and Dresden bombings, being two old hands, having lived through the war. And the Queen was enabled by Simon, because of their friendship, to talk of her visit to the German Democratic Republic in Leipzig before the wall came down, and herself being surprised and moved to tears and in her spirit to a new hope by being shown the cathedral in darkness and seeing hundreds and hundreds of Germans holding candles in the dark. So being a new creation in Christ is not a static piety, but daily participation, both personal and public, in the offer of this gift, this is the second thing in the passage, of reconciliation. The personal baptism promises of turning to Christ repenting of sins, rejecting evil, that will have said if you are a baptised Christian for you or by you, are made in a moment, but they should be experienced over a lifetime. We are being made perfect, as Gillian Rose would have it, failing towards, and now a not yet process of continuous repentance. At this point I start to get into the hand, the hand signals and the the work, if you've ever heard Simon. I once, I've got to break up now. One of, one of the times I had to give a talk of his, or his script, in his handwriting, to an ecumenical group in rugby. He was sick. And um, I can't remember a word of what it said. But what I do remember being criticised positively afterwards by getting so involved in the language and the, the movement and the detail and the inspiration 
that all people remembered was that Simon had actually been there. <laughs> I'm not doing so well today. You see, this is allowing ourself to be grasped by Christ, who said, I chose you. You did not choose me. A profound countercultural appeal against individualism and individual isolation. So let's take a moment today uh, to be reaffirmed in Christ, if that is our way, or to listen carefully to these claims of the living God of history. And remember, if we are too isolated in our way to join a small group or to know that there are welcoming congregations worshipping the living God all over this land and round the world for you. Yet, this God of all is for the whole creation, not just the individual, not just the personal salvation. The personal encounter with God of the cross, the tomb and resurrection, receiving the gift of faith, if we will, goes with a divine expectation of turning from the new redeemed being made perfect self to the broken world with the ministry of reconciliation. And much of Simon's work, his intellectual and pastoral life, was spent wrestling with reconciling people to God, themselves and others, in contexts that are not just post-Christendom and post-modern, but contemporary in every era and truly worldwide. Here are applied gospel principles, and if you like, if you can follow it, with Hegelian dialectic, in a perpetual motion of engagement with all sorts and conditions of people. Simon's newsletters, which we've just heard read from, reflect profound outreach with the gospel and into community and international experiences and dilemmas. So the question for us today that he would put to us is what wisdom and transformation will we apply to today's big themes? Toxic racism, economic inequality or autocratic power, to mention just three. Can we, Christians or not, learn to have courageous conversations such as he would have with appreciation and participation overcoming trolling and cancelling, a calling we should all have. If the big issues are beyond us, except in prayer, at least we can, as Simon always did and never neglected, pay attention to persons and their needs for reconciliation and practical support, whether it's an asylum seeker, an outer estate, a priest, a godchild, a mission partner, a student or professor, and I hope you will know stories of those encounters. So, we, you and I, are to be ambassadors for Christ. Are you up for it? Did you feel like that? You didn't come here to be lectured, but you came here to celebrate. And this is the sort of person we are celebrating, with the Ministry of Reconciliation. And three key elements, in closing, that express that ambassador's life, I think, were hospitality, friendship and community. Learning the skills of hospitality, welcome, table fellowship and open house for neighbours and strangers, to know how to visit or meet in cafes or pubs is a wonderful gift. And often in a great university town like this, we see that expressed time and time again. At Bishop's House Coventry, Simon and Jean immediately introduced their new vicar to all their neighbours in the area, which formed lasting pastoral opportunities. And I hope that he would be pleased that uh, at Ramadan in Birmingham, I and other Christians have the joy of hosting Muslims at Bishop's Croft for iftar at the close of the daily fast. But another gift of the ambassador is friendship. We've heard that wonderful poem. Thank you, Mary, for reading it. In the high sense described in that poem and also by C.S. Lewis, where the only question is, do you see the same truth? an unpossessive, non-judgmental gift of friendship. And uh, to encourage you in adventuring in that, if you get the gift of that sort of friendship, um, it can survive the ignoring of wise advice, such as that given to me by Simon in my 20s, that by no means or under any circumstances I should be ordained in the Church of Christ. <laughs> get to the top of BP first. When you've done that, where you'll be much more of a Christian witness, and then you can think about church ministry when you've retired. Most of this, of course, was followed up in an illegible, round-the-page, handwritten reference, um, which actually promoted the cause for me 
to become a bishop eventually. You see, that is friendship that is spacious enough to allow growth of the person as a unique child of God urged on by the love of Christ, an embassy of hospitality and friendship, and of course, um, expressed perhaps particularly for his beloved college. Simon was an ambassador for community, where he wrote, the truly Maglinian virtues of humane, Christian, Christian rooted relationships, of the valuing of the whole person, and not just the intellect, can be cherished and realized through continuing resilience, imagination, and readiness for fresh exploration. Well, I'm sure that's going on right now, and uh, some of you will be able to experience it shortly. At an anniversary party in Cambridge, near the end of Simon's life, only a few years ago, Helen thought it would be a good idea for me to be the next guardian of the crozier, that's the great stick that bishops carry around, um, that had been given to Simon by a previous Bishop of Coventry, the well-known Cuthbert Bardsley. It's a convenient item because it's in a box and you can carry it around on your motorbike or in the car as you go to the holy and particular churches. Simon had said very little throughout this celebration, but at this question, looked up, alert, and smiling with his usual twinkle in his eye, and said, oh, yes, of course, for David, uh, but perhaps not quite yet. <laughs> what will you and I do with the time remaining to us? Are you a new creation in Christ, or need, like Nicodemus, to be born again? Are you reconciled to God through Christ, so that you too can exercise the, uh, the ministry of reconciliation in the world? Are you going to go from this great church today, or this great celebration this afternoon, as an ambassador for Christ, and so honour our friend Simon? We are being blessed by the company and love of one who knew the way of becoming the righteousness of God, it says at the end of that passage. I'm going to have four lines of a poem that you'll know very well, not quoted so far. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Praying, I trust, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God.
The Jesus prayer is a repeated prayer, and it's just one sentence. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, or have mercy upon us, or sometimes have mercy upon me a sinner. And that prayer is an invocation of the presence of Christ, essentially. It's a practice of the presence of Christ, and so it helps the person praying, in it, praying it to be drawn closer to him. As the person repeats the prayer, they are focusing not on themselves repeating the prayer, but on the presence of Christ and invoking that presence in their mind and in their imagination and in their heart. And as they do that, that sense of presence usually grows and they begin to become drawn into him and he into them. Dwell in me and I in you, as he said. So it was much more than just a prayer or a way of praying. It was really an entry into a very much deeper union with God in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. It was only by the Holy Spirit that it was emphasized and by invoking the Holy Spirit that we could enter in that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the communion, the fellowship of his suffering. And so it's being drawn through his cross and resurrection into a new life with him, always being prepared for participating in the new creation which he is bringing into being. Come Holy Spirit, draw us through that, your power, creative and redeeming power, into the life, death and resurrection of our Saviour Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. Draw us into union with Father, Son and Holy Spirit the triune of God through Christ who draws us in the power of the Spirit into union with his Father. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. O God, send your Holy Spirit and draw us through the life, death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ into your triune love. give you thanks that through his life and in his death you drew Simon more and more deeply into your love 
We rejoice in his confidence in your son's death and resurrection and in the life-giving power of the Spirit. We give you thanks for all that Simon drew out of us, for the love he taught us, the prayer and wisdom he shared, for words, warmth, song, blessing, laughter. We give you thanks for the many lives across the globe fired by his witness to your love and forgiveness. Apart from you, we can do nothing. Draw us from lives worthy of our calling and love flowing from your pardon. give you thanks that your love in us draws us more deeply to each other. We pray for all who accompanied Simon in his aging and cared for him. We pray for all who mourn and know today the loss born of love. We pray for Jean, Mary, Helen, James, Godfrey, Honor, for all the family and friends and for those who could not say goodbye. You have promised to be with us always to the end of the age. Draw near to us and comfort us by your spirit. We give you thanks that we can share in the power of Christ's resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. We pray for those who long for Christ's remaking of the world, for the people of many nations at war, for the peacemakers, the community of the Cross of Nails in Coventry, Dresden and around the world, for the College of St Mary Magdalene in this university as we seek the common good. We pray for a deep sharing in each other's gifts as the body of Christ. For the churches in which Simon shared, in Nigeria, Berlin, Mount Athos, in Birmingham, Tolishant Knights and Coventry. For the Church Mission Society and its partners. Draw from every tongue and every heart your song of salvation. give you thanks that in Christ we dwell in you as you dwell in us. By the utmost cost of his love on the cross, may we receive the free gift of his life, now and at the hour of our death. Draw us to you and prepare us too for your new creation. O God, who has prepared for them that love thee such good things as pass our understanding, pour into our hearts such love toward thee that we, loving thee above all things, may obtain thy promises which exceed all that we can desire, through Jesus Christ our Lord. As our 
our Saviour taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is now. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
eastbound. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, from henceforth, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Even so saith the Spirit, for they rest from their labours. Almighty God, in your great love you crafted us by your hand, and breathed life into us by your Spirit. Although we became a rebellious people, you did not abandon us to our sin. In your tender mercy you sent your Son to restore in us your image. In obedience to your will, he gave up his life for us, bearing in his body our sins on the cross. By your mighty power you raised him from the grave and exalted him to the throne of glory. Rejoicing in his victory and trusting in your promise to make alive all who turn to Christ, we commend Simon to your mercy. And we join with all your faithful people and the whole company of heaven in the one unending song of praise. Glory and wisdom and honour be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Behold, I make all things new. It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. We share the peace together. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of his peace.
the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, <coughs> that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every way to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you and those for whom you pray, now and always. Amen. As we go, we will be blessed, at least as a Highlander, I'll be blessed by the pipes played by Helen's father-in-law, Anthony Orr.